So glad to have you with us as we continue our devotional study of the Beatitudes, Jesus' great sermon introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And we come to the fourth of the Beatitudes today, which is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Our last beatitude had to do with becoming humble or meek, that that should be a character trait of the Christian that slays our spiritual pride. Well, in the fourth beatitude, we now turn to another growing character trait of a Christ follower, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Let's begin with the words hungering and thirsting. We all know what that means in the physical, in the bodily world. We don't eat for a long time. We get really, really hungry and need to get some calories into our system. We go out and work for a few hours in the hot sun. We come in and we've got to get some hydration, some water into our systems. We know what it is in our bodies to hunger and to thirst for sustenance. And of course, what Jesus is saying here is blessed are those who hunger in that same way for spiritual righteousness, to be righteous in their spirits before God, to live uprightly with other people, and to have a sense of rightness within their own consciences. And blessed are those who thirst for the same thing. We're really thirsty to live upright in all relationships of life. Do we do that? Does that characterize our lives? Well, I think oftentimes in the American church, this is not a strong theme. We don't hear much preaching and teaching about being right, living right. Other associated words are being godly or being holy. No, those are not the kinds of words that pepper our sermons and our teaching series very frequently in the church today. I think D.A. Carson, New Testament scholar, says it very, very well. Let me read a quote of his. The pursuit of righteousness is not even popular among professing Christians today. Many today seek other things, spiritual maturity, real happiness, the power of the Holy Spirit. They hunger for spiritual experiences. They thirst for a consciousness of God. But how many hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, this being said, those other things that Carson mentions are not bad, but they're not the thing that Jesus points us to. He doesn't say, though, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after spiritual experiences or hunger and thirst after a sense of the power of the Holy Spirit, hunger and thirst after living a Christian life in terms of the way that we handle our money, our finances, our kids. Those are all good things. But no, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst to be right with God and others and within themselves. So again, do we? Is that a passion within our lives? Well, as we think about this, let's talk about what this righteousness actually is. And there are two pieces to it. First of all, we define it as a desire and a hunger to conform to the will of God. We are hungry and thirsty for what God would direct us to to the things that God values and cherishes and loves. You know, that first of all has to do with our relationship with God. We hunger and thirst to have a right relationship with him. I can remember this from back in my early days as a Christian, when I would go on Sunday evenings with my older brother to a Church of God in Christ. For those who don't know, that's Black Pentecostal uh, worship. It was great, loved it. It was such a new experience of the faith for me. One of the songs that we would sing was, get right with God and do it now. Get right with God and he will show you how. Down at the cross where he died for you, get right with God, get right, get right with God. And I can remember singing that song and saying, Jesus, Lord, I want to get right with you. I want to live right with you. Help me not to walk out of the service without being cleansed and purified and ready to walk uprightly with you. Sometimes we say in the Lord's Prayer, you know, well, we do say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can transfer and translate that to say, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. That's a hunger and thirst after righteousness. But in addition to that, it has to do with being right with other people. 
We can think of the golden rule in this one. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Treat other people as a Christian, as a representative, an ambassador of Jesus Christ in the way that you wish other people would treat you right back. And this applies certainly to individual relationships with our family members, co-workers, people in the church. But let us not overlook that this righteousness with others has to do with society and culture. We are to, indeed, do unto others of different religions, as we would have those people of different religions do unto us. Do unto others those who are different ethnicities, as we would have them do to us. Do those who are of a different race, as we wish people of a different race would do to us. Do to people of the opposite sex in the way that we treat them, the way we, that we would like to be treated. Do to those who we disagree with and don't see eye to eye with in the same way that we would have them treat us. Avoid the shrill, avoid the polarization, but walk in love and in charity with those who are different than ourselves. We are to be indeed God's salt and light, not just on an individual basis, but in all of society. We are, as John R. W. Stott said, to be Christ's counterculture in this world. So that too is part of this righteousness. So how are we filled and satisfied with this righteousness? Well, I think we need to point to two things. First of all, we can be satisfied because in terms of our position before God, Jesus came for the very purpose of making us righteous. This is known as the doctrine of justification. Justification means to be made right or righteous before God. And surely Jesus was not specifically mentioning this in this beatitude, but his entire ministry made it possible. Jesus went to the cross. He died there to bear the burden and the punishment for our sins. He died and rose again for our salvation. And when we receive this gift of salvation, we are justified. That's the great watchword at the center of the Protestant Reformation. On this particular doctrine, said Lutheran, the church rises and falls. Calvin said it was the hinge of the Christian faith that we are justified. And that means that our sins are imputed to Jesus where he died for them on the cross. And his righteousness is imputed or given or credited to us because he is the spotless Lamb of God, the only perfect one. We indeed are in Christ. We are clothed in the righteous robes of our Savior. And so positionally, we can always be satisfied that Jesus has made us right with God in that positional sense. But then secondly, we are to live out and live into that position in our condition. We are free because he has made us right to learn to live right with God and others and within our own souls. We indeed grow in righteousness. We hunger and thirst after it, and the more righteous we become before God, the more godly, the more holy, the more we will want that with God. The more we will want that to be what uh, typifies our relationships with other people and the more our souls will thrive in living right before God. You know, if we're Christians, this should be a growing character trait. Just like humility is a growing character trait, hungering and thirsting after righteousness will be the same. And we will see progress that will be fulfilled on that final day when we see God face to face. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be satisfied. From that, today we will turn the next time to the fifth beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What do being righteous and being merciful have to do with one another? The answer, everything. We'll turn to that subject next time. We'll talk to you then.